Be the twelfth, I think, isn't it? August the twelfth is uh -huh. in okay. the twelfth. I think you're right. August the twelfth, so don't go on the night. Yeah. September, we still have uh, Manila Oakland on board. October, Susie asked you. November, Melissa and archives at six o'clock. You want to do it a week later on a Tuesday? Um, you want to think about it? Yeah. Okay, we'll think about that between now and then. December, our real fellowship. Six o'clock, Kay French will present a program. But that is not here to address the bricks. Do you know anything about what happened with that? Okay. We've got some money in that account. Well, allocated for it. Well, they were going to, I think, let the city of Erin pick up some of that uh, right. because we thought we could wrap that up and, and they may want to extend that. Um, just for your information, Tennessee Crossroads will have a segment on the Robertson County Museum Thursday at 7 o'clock. This Thursday? Yes. Okay. And if you've never been to the Springfield or Robertson County Museum, it's worth a trip. It is wonderful. And I mentioned that we'll be finishing up the cemetery project, and Jackie and Donald will be on the program for August. Do you want to say anything about the maps yet, or just? Yeah, when, whenever, Debbie. You want to talk about that now, or? Maps. Yeah, we, yeah, we can go ahead. Okay. Well, we've been working on this about three years, I guess, and we're about to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It doesn't look like a train anymore. But what we've got, the uh, Austin P State, the GIS Center there, did these maps for us, and we've got about 230 cemeteries in Houston County. They've got two sizes. This one is a two to three. And then this other one is a three to four on it. And it has the cemeteries listed by alphabetical order. And then we're going to put an index with those that's got the numbers and then the cross references back to the number in the book on that. Uh, where we're at on what we've done, 
often pay that the math for us for like two hundred dollars, which is a I mean just a phenomenal price to do that. And what we would think about and think what we ought to do is maybe order a few of the smaller maps, and I don't know about the bigger one that's happened for the program next month. So what I would think if we could order a minimum of ten on that, there's twenty five dollars for this and forty for this is what it cost us now. If we sell them, I think we ought to get a little bit just to, to handle them and, and put up with them on that. But I guess what, what I'm looking at tonight is what we want to do as far as the maps and also with the $200 that we spent to off the pay as far as the maps and stuff. So it's whatever you all think about ordering them uh, with that. I mean, if you order 10, that'd be 250 If you got 200 to map, that'd be 450 If you got two of those, that would be 530 what you'd be looking at on that. And tell how they correspond with the Green Cemetery book. Okay, the numbers are the same. The only thing, the new ones, we jumped up, what, eight decks? Yeah. And where they where we could differentiate between the green ones and stuff. So the numbers relate back to the Green Book, and there's a lot of good information on the Green Book. Hopefully we can sell some of those, because we've got, what, over 90, I think, on that. A little less than 100. Okay. And everything with it on that. So. And we'll have those available at the meeting. Right. And to, try and put some kind of package deal maybe together. <laughs> and we will have the have the index with that too. On that. And we can decide what we're going to charge for whatever. Biggest thing I need to know is if we need to order these for next month. So. Anybody think they might be interested or we'll get with Donald after the meeting and say, hey, you know, I'd like to have a big one or a little one? Or yeah, I, I think I'd rather just go and order a certain number. And have them available. Yeah. You think 10 of those, two of those? Well, yeah, if we need two of the big ones right. and everything. I figured you would need one in the archives. Right. Um, I'll, I'll make a motion that we buy 10 of the small ones and two of the big ones so we can sell them at the next Is there a second on that? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Uh, any opposed? All right, we'll have them available. And uh, we. Be, be sure to check it and tell us where our mistakes are. <laughs> so the new ones that aren't in the green book, so there's a new listing of those? It's new listings, but it's the same number. Yeah. We, we, we kept the numbers in the green book, yeah. then the new ones we jumped up and started, you know, like 200 okay. on those. So anything in the green book, we'll have the, the green book number and page number that it's on in the green book yeah. and then we've got them alphabetically listed on the index of the map. So the map has numbers and names? The, it has numbers on the reference on the map and then it's alphabetically listed on the bottom. Oh. You didn't have enough room to put yeah. all of them so oh, we've yeah. got numbers on the map and then it's listed alphabetically on the bottom of the index. So I couldn't see it except that it was a map. So you're saying there's numbers all over there and that number is that cemetery. Correct. And, oh, that's wonderful. And then we've got an index that'll go to the numbers from one to 240 or whatever on that, so. And we did latitude and longitude and elevation. So they put a lot of work into it. So Melissa, if you will give us an update on the archives our speaker since you're uh, Before you get out, August 12th is a Friday. I think yeah. it is August 9th. Okay. Let's just see here. The 11th. Or the 11th is Thursday. Oh. Where the second Tuesday? What's the second Tuesday? Second Tuesday. Ninth. Ninth. Right? The ninth wins. Okay. August 9th. Thank you. Not wrong. <laughs> archives and museum. Uh, first I want to tell you if you haven't seen it please stop by and see our new sign. It's only taken us 11 years to get it but I'm very proud of it. Um, and since we got it um, I guess almost two months ago we have had a lot of visitors. People are just coming in because oh we have a museum. I said we've had a museum for over 10 years we've just been able to afford a sign. <laughs> so, <laughs> so please tell everybody to come see the museum. Um, and we've also actually been recognized by the state. Um, they, we've been invited to be part of the state um, uh, museums, the Tennessee Museum Association. So we'll be a member of that. Uh, so moving along, um, I just want to point out real quick, um, this 
Carol Harshman Hank is here tonight. She spent all afternoon with me in the archives. Uh, she lives in East Tennessee, but she comes here about once a year, so this is an annual trip for her. She researches Parchman and Summers. Any other surnames? Well, that's that's Parchman and Summers here. So if you have, have a connection to Parchman and Summers, talk to her before she leaves, because uh, she's done a lot of research. Um, I'm also trying to give you an update on what donations we've gotten, which we've gotten several donations. Um, we've bought a couple of things off of eBay. Um, I'm going to leave what I brought over here. Many of you might know Tracy Reader, um, Ann Reader's father. And he actually, it's funny because she brought this to me. She says, he said she found it in a drawer and didn't know what to do with it. That's how we usually get things. So um, I've seen several of these for our schools. These are um, souvenir. I don't know if they do these at commencement or what, but this is for the Magnolia School from 1919. Um, like I said, I've seen several of these for our school. And it's got all of the pupils listed. And it's in very good shape for 1919. He also had a couple of photographs of the, um, of the, I call it the green elevator. I know it's not the green elevator, but this one we've seen, I think even uh, Jerry's found some pictures. This one I have not seen, so I think this is a new angle, a new photo. It says Coal Bridge being unloaded at Danville Loading Pier. So you might want to look at that. I'll leave it here. And then this is an eBay purchase. You know, um, in our main meeting, uh, actually Susan Knight Gore actually had been donating money for us to purchase things off of eBay since. Um, as a government entity, I cannot do that. Um, and then in our May meeting, we had run out of that $100. Jerry, we got it approved to put some more money into that kitty. So this is one of the next things that we have uh, gotten. This is uh, Rosher Brothers Lime and General Merchandise. It is dated August 19th, 1901. Oh, it always amazes me how good condition this document paper can be. Uh, this is actually to Mr. J.D. Boone. And these two things were sold together. This is a postcard. We've seen this postcard before, but uh, when I showed it to Donald, he, he told me, he says, that's one of the more clearer renditions of this photograph that they've seen, we've seen. So I'll put this over here. That came off of eBay. And um, since our May meeting, I actually went and visited Miss Susie Askew, who was here, who's been here, and she's going to be speaking about the mapping the White Oak area. She invited me out to her cabin. And this cabin, I don't know if anybody knows about this cabin, but it's very, very old. It actually had been moved when TVA flooded Danville. So I went out and visited her. She donated a couple of paintings by Miss Irene Summers. Uh, so they are in the archives. She also gave us some records that were found in the cabin for the Tomlinson and Askew family. These date back to before we were even a county. So we've got those processed. We've done the finding aid on that, and that's ready to go. So it's, uh, we're very grateful that she, she doesn't have any children, grandchildren, or anyone to give these things to. So she's been talking to us about donating um, a lot of what the family had. So she's just starting to do that. So we're very grateful. <coughs> Um, I still continue to research the Houston College. I know I talked about it last time, but I wanted to talk about it again. Um, the Houston College, we believe, was located where what we call the Roby House today was, is today. That house was actually built by Mr. Hobbs. Um, I've been able to document the Houston College uh, from 1889 was when the newspaper says they laid the foundations. The first graduating class was in 1890. Um, you remember me telling you that the professor from Virginia Tech, which started all of this, had a diploma for his great-grandmother. Uh, her name was, um, Holiday was her last name, Bessie Holiday. Went to that college in 1891, graduated. The diploma is like this big. Here, welcome to the archives to see it, it's huge. And so that's what got me started. So I've been able to trace the college and its existence up to 1906. So it was a college for a fairly good amount of time. So far I've been able to figure out that it is, wasn't just a women's college or a girls' college, it had both men and women. 
Um, but this diploma and this student is the only student that I know of that I've been able to document. Went to school there or graduated there. I did find a record that said in 1891, five students graduated from the college that year. And so the house that's there now um, was supposedly built in 1911. So between 1906 and 1911, <coughs> something happened to the college. I can't, I, so far, I cannot find what happened to the college. I mean, if it burned, you should think there'd be something in the newspaper, but I can't find anything in the newspaper. Um, if they just closed it and tore it down, I was able to get a copy of the college's charter that they filed with the Secretary of State. So I have a list of the trustees. Um, Ms. Ann's family is very well represented. <laughs> there are two Roshers that were trustees. Uh, two Bucos, B-U-Q-U-O. We didn't know that name for the founding of our county. Uh, C.N. Parker, um, G.T. Abernathy was also a trustee. And these would have been the men that would have started this college and pretty much kept it going. Um, I have, I've actually, yet today, no, yesterday, I looked at the tax record. There is no records of the college paying taxes, so I'm thinking that they were exempt from taxes. But yesterday I found in the 1900 taxes, because you know the tax records have the person who's paying the tax, and then it lists who lives north, south, east, and west. So I went through all of District 4 to see if the college was a neighbor to anybody. And I found what I hoped I'd find because the what we call the Mitchum House today, which was the V.R. Harris House, he built it in 1900. He is listed as the college being his neighbor. So I found that yesterday, which verifies the fact that they were in fact next to each other. So we have our location correct. So if anybody can search their family records or if you happen as researchers run across anything about the Houston College, please let me know. Um, and lastly, um, I haven't said anything in a long time, but we are always looking for volunteers um, to come and help us at the archives. You don't have to come and stay at the archives. I actually have some projects that you can take home with you and work on and bring them back. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. And now I'm going to introduce our speaker. And I'm, if, please correct me if I think I said it wrong. I got this off of an article. <laughs> Believe Chronicle article. Uh oh. So yeah, uh, from 2019. Uh, I looked for a biography for you. So uh, okay, uh, Miss Brown is an avid researcher and historian for her hometown, Clarksville, Tennessee. She is a fourth-generation Clarksvillian, a past educator in the Clarksville Montgomery County school system, a frequent guest speaker at civic clubs and organizations. She enjoys volunteering her time to give tours of Riverview and Greenwood cemeteries, as well as uh, bicycle and walking tours of the historic downtown district. Uh, Ms. Farrell has also been involved with the Clarksville Montgomery County Arts and Heritage Council's Discovery Trust project and the ongoing suffragist project to be celebrated in 2020, which we did and you did. Uh, let's see, in 2017, Ms. Farrell was a co-recipient of the Council's Lifetime Achievement Award in Heritage. Her passions are researching and writing as well as traveling, gardening, reenacting, and spending time with her grandchildren. So please welcome Ms. Carolyn Farrell about her book, Beneath the First Bless. Tell me a time. Are, are we? Oh, you're good. I'm good. You're good. <laughs> you are all here because you are interested in history and you are actively researching I am so impressed by that because I have an inkling of the time that it took to do what you've done. <laughs> Keep that up. Saving history is integral to understanding your county and preserving the history is something we all need to do. Uh, I want to tell you that I'm a biologist. <laughs> I am not a, a writer. I, I claim to be an author, but I am not a writer in the sense that I was not trained to be a writer. But uh, I, I fell into writing these books. This is my tenth and final book uh, because of a dead person. <laughs> yes, that's a dead person who got me involved in this. So it's been a love. It's been a, uh, a saving grace for me through some difficult times, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I thank the people who I know. Skis actively researching Brenda Harper, of course Melissa, 
but so many of you that I'm not aware of are actively researching. Please keep that up. It's so important. Uh, the book itself, like I said, this is my last book. I'm, I've got other projects that I want to do. But you may look at the title and go, what does that mean? We Wait Beneath the Furnace Blast. Well, uh, the, there was a poem written which was supposed to stir up anti-slavery sentiments before the Civil War. And the poem was entitled, We Wait Beneath the Furnace Blast. And it's about the slaves that were waiting for something to happen from this war to get them away from these furnaces because you can imagine. I need to ask how any of you from north of the Mason Dixon line? God. <laughs> I have to be careful how I write things because I'm a southerner by birth and, and my family lost their plantation in the Civil War and, and all that. My history goes back to that type of thing. We did own slaves. We our family owned 23 slaves. But I have a lady from Ohio that, that uh, edits my books and she'll call me and say Carolyn, you can't say that. <laughs> you need to take that out, Carolyn. I was like, but it's it's a you can't say that. So okay, okay, I'll take it out. This book is so multifaceted. It's, I had to ask, what is your main interest? Are, are you interested in the furnace? Are you interested in the people that were involved with the furnace? Are you interested in the Civil War part of it? Are you interested in the diary that started all this? Um, what exactly? I'm getting a feel that it's probably the furnace part that you're more interested in, or, or Civil War, or... I'm interested in all of them. Civil War. Really. Okay, okay. Uh, this, what happened, I was researching uh, my ninth book, and I came upon this diary, and it was about Dixon County, but the problem was there were so many people from Montgomery County that were in it, and I'm thinking, what do I do? Because I always write about Montgomery County, and I, I justified it. There's too many people from Montgomery County in this book that I can, you know, and Dixon County works like, like sister counties to begin with. But it was a labor of love. It was one uh, that, uh, when it was done, it was something that I was proud of, not because I did it, but because I had a feeling that the history was, was saved because we lose so much of our history. But uh, the, the book started with me finding this, this diary. It was about a, a girl, and uh, she was aged 18, in Cumberland Furnace that was living in the Furnace area when the Civil War broke out. Uh, there was a diary before that time period, but it's lost. They don't know where it is. But I called University of Tennessee. I used to work at the main library there and uh, asked them if it would be okay for me to transcribe it. It had been transcribed, but incorrectly, uh, because the person transcribing it, not their fault, was not from Montgomery County, and therefore they got names wrong. They got other things wrong. Uh, so uh, that you need to have somebody from that area that understands what's going on. But if you want a real feel for what's going on uh, at, a, at a furnace during the Civil War, this is the book. Uh, in Clarksville, we have a, a diary that really details what's going on in North Clarksville very well. That's the Surrender Journal. Uh, journal. We had Nanny Haskins, which was in downtown Clarksville. Now this takes care of the southern part of Montgomery County, northern part of Dixon County. Uh, I, the first year that I was married, I lived in Woods Valley Road, which is uh, part of Cumberland Furnace, so I had an attachment to that. But to get to the furnace, uh, to get to the actual history, the first furnace that actually came into that area was Socks and Steel, and uh, uh, very fascinating. Not a lot of information on it, but uh, there is some uh, information about it in the book. Uh, then we go to Napier's. I didn't do a lot of research on that because of where I'm trying to focus. You can go so many different directions, and you know that you can bird walk when you're doing research. You can go off on this, and then you go off on this one. you got to stay focused. So then I started with a James Robertson. Yes, the James Robertson <coughs> started his furnace and Cumberland Furnace. 1797, we believe, uh, maybe even earlier, by two years. He started what's called a hillside furnace where you butt up to a, a limestone bluff. You have an overshot wheel. You've got a water source there. Very crude uh, setup there. But James Robertson, as you know, was so involved in so many things from the beginning of the state. Billy Blunt had him doing all sorts of surveying and sent him off to the Nickajack expedition in, uh, in East Tennessee that he couldn't spend the time or the effort into the furnace like he knew he needed to. So he sold it to a man by the name of Montgomery Bell. And I'm excited because. I think I've got, if you've ever wondered, everybody has a theory about why Montgomery Bell sold his slaves after he went to so much trouble to get them down here and 
you know, preserve them and so forth as his property. Why did he sell them? I've got a theory and I'll get to that. But Montgomery Bell, and here I can hear about my southern thing here. Up in Pennsylvania, there were several major ironworks. We're talking about the Van Leers, we're talking about the, uh, certainly we're talking about the, uh, of course, the, uh, I'm trying to come up with a name. Uh, Sorry? Stafford? Yes, thank you. And of course, they went more to Stewart County. But these were Pennsylvania ironworks. Montgomery Bell alone had between 200 and 300 slaves, okay? Now he's up there and the laws in Pennsylvania according to or how they, uh, how they uh, treat slaves is changing and he realizes that if he's gonna keep his ironworks going, he's gonna have to get his slaves out of Pennsylvania. So looking down into the area, he saw where Napier was, the Western Highland Rim is through here, big vein of iron and he decided that's where he needed to go. So he brought his slaves down here to begin his iron furnace. The Van Leers came down with their slaves because for the same reason they had to come down. So I'm, I'm here to <laughs> Okay, so he's got all these slaves that he's brought down. Uh, Montgomery Bell was, he was obscure by, he seemed to be a, a, a different person to different people. A lot of people that were close to him couldn't really understand his thinking. But let me give you a background on Montgomery Bell. He was the youngest son of his father, uh, John Bell, not related to the one that was the iron worker here uh, in the Tennessee, but he was the 10th son. His oldest brother was Patterson Bell. Patterson Bell was a colonel in the Revolutionary War, decorated man, very respected, very well educated. Well, by the time that Montgomery Bell came along, <coughs> there wasn't money in the family for him to be educated like his brother Patterson. That was a thorn in his side for his entire life. No matter how much money he made, it always bothered him that he did not get that education. Not anything towards his brother, anger, or anything else, no, nothing like that. But it just always bothered him. And that's gonna be a big player in what he does later on. So Montgomery Bell comes down, he buys James Robertson's uh, furnace, and he runs it for a number of years. But Montgomery Bell, in his mindset, is always looking for the next best thing. He's always going beyond, bigger, better, and so forth. Sometimes it gets him into trouble because when he bought the narrows of the harbor, he thought with, with General Andrew Jackson's help that the U.S. government was going to buy that area and put an armory there. Well, even in the 40s, 1840s and 50s, there's still rumblings or there's rumblings of the Civil War about to break out. The U.S. government is not going to put an armory down south. They're just not going to do it even though Andrew Jackson, who had bought his, uh, his cannonballs from Montgomery Bell during the War of 1812 and used them in New Orleans, uh, knew about Montgomery Bell, you know, he endorsed him. So uh, Montgomery Bell was stuck with the narrows on the harpoon for a long time before he, you know, he didn't, I don't think he even ended up selling it. I think his daughter, uh, his daughter's uh, husband did. But Montgomery Bell, uh, through the years, made a profit with, with the furnace and he, came to the point in his life where he decided he was he was going he wanted to marry. Now Montgomery Bell lived in the same conditions as the slaves, which is another reason why he's such a hard thing to pin down. <coughs> he lived in horrible conditions. He ate the same food as the slaves, and yet there was a time period when he moved to Nashville and he built a mansion there. <coughs> if you recall this woman evangelist that died in an airplane crash with her husband, uh, they landed in a crash in a one of the lakes near Nashville. That house that they lived in, that made, they made it into a state, what the original house was Montgomery Bell's mansion. Montgomery <coughs> Bell allowed his slaves to come inside the mansion and actually start bonfires on the floors, in the, in the bottom floor, and cook their meals there. He just had no concept of, of what was correct in any way, but he, he uh, left Nashville, sold his mansion, sold his land, and went back to Cumberland Furnace because he said that that venture failed miserably. He couldn't find a wife. Now, supposedly he, had, well, he did have a daughter uh, that he had by a woman. All we know about her was her name was Miss Moss. Obviously, she didn't marry him, but he did raise this, this lady and he did educate her. So, Montgomery Bell reaches a time in his life where he is uh, bothered by slavery. He's doing a complete uh, about face. 
Let's go back to Patterson Bell. Patterson Bell, like I said, he owned an estate up in Pennsylvania, very wealthy, very well respected, the refugee for runaway slaves. He was part of the Underground Railroad. Now, the one person that Montgomery Bell looked up to was Patterson. He didn't have enough time with his father to be influenced by him, but Patterson Bell probably had a talk with him and said, you know, this is something you need to do. That's what I believe in my heart, that's what he did, because the only person that could ever talk to him and reason with him was Patterson Bell. So, uh, and his part of the Underground Railroad was called the Pilgrim Pathway. So, if you ever look that up. If Patterson Bell had been caught doing this, he would have been totally humiliated, probably would have been thrown in prison for aiding uh, runaway slaves. So it was a great risk that he did this. Uh, Patterson, uh, Montgomery Bell, got about half of the slaves sent over to Iberia for the recolonization uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, he died before the other two, uh, or there were actually two sets that made up the other half, were sent over. If you saw the massive amount of money that it took to send those slaves over there, he not only paid for their passage over there, but he also had to support them for six months once they arrived there. Now, a lot of these slaves, and people argue this too, a lot of these slaves were his offspring. And that happened, you know, in Southern culture. Uh, that's not, I don't believe that's why he did that. I don't think in any sense that he did that. Uh, Montgomery Bell was always conscious that he had lots of nephews and nieces that wanted his money and so he would rewrite his will occasionally and jerk them around. Just love doing that. Oh, you're written out of my will. Oh, you're written out of my will. Oh, gosh. You know, I, I'm getting along with them. You know, so all that going on. But to show you again how important education was to him, he had a, I think it was a sister that came down uh, and asked him, Montgomery Bell, for money to send her son to school, to college. And Montgomery Bell looks at his, his uh, trusted slave, uh, James Worley, and says, go get him $5,000. And he opens up the trunk and just takes out $5,000 and gives it to him. $5,000 back then, can you imagine? It was no question about it. So Montgomery Bell, again, when he dies, uh, he dies pretty much alone. Uh, again, he didn't, have, he didn't have friends in that sense. I think he had slaves that were loyal to him, but not in the sense that uh, you, you count real friends. He's buried near the Narrows of the Harpeth in a cemetery that's on a private property. Uh, the Haynes uh, Farm is, is there. That's where he is buried. Uh, before he died, in his final, we think his final will, he bequeathed a lot of money to start the Montgomery Bell Academy. I'm just wondering, because of him having between 200 and 300 slaves, if somebody's not going to try to attempt to change the name of that school. Sorry about that? Uh, he also left some money to some of his nieces and nephews. Now, what happened to his, uh, his iron business? Well, his daughter and son-in-law uh, lost everything. They lost everything. They tried and tried to keep it going. It just didn't work, and the son-in-law committed suicide. He felt that he had failed Montgomery Bell. He felt real guilt towards that, and uh, therefore took his life. So what happened to the furnace back in Cumberland Furnace? That was uh, purchased by the Van Leers. Uh, several of the brothers that were fighting among themselves up north, it's so funny, they would sue each other, but they got along. And they sued each other to get along, but this one would pair off with this brother, and this one would pair off, and they would sue each other. It was crazy stuff going on, but it wasn't taken personally because the Van Leers supposedly are very gregarious, outgoing people, uh, love to fight because they come from a long lineage of, of people that, that fought in wars. But still, uh, the, the brothers came down, and we got Isaac, and we have uh, Anthony Van Leer. Uh, they came down. Now, one of them was rich, another one was poor. That's going to be important later on, too. So Van Leers took over the furnace and they moved it uh, down further down on Dry Hollow Road. And you can see where the furnace used to stand and uh, some of the buildings that were there. there. The building that he used as an office building is still standing. Well, Van Leer had a daughter that died, in a, it's a long story, but she, he, built, he built her a mansion in Nashville. That building was actually standing, I think I can remember it because I lived for a short while in Nashville back in the 50s, 60s. Yes, I'm that old. Uh, they, that is the mansion. Uh, it was actually used for the uh, music conservatory for a while before they tore it down. I think the Andrew Jackson building is staying on that spot now. But he built her this mansion and she came in, this is uh, 
Anthony Van Leer's door, comes in, looks at this mansion and says, I will go to, up those stairs and I will never see these stairs again. She died giving birth. She never came down those stairs again. The daughter was beautiful. Florence uh, Van Leer was, was beautiful. Uh, she uh, turned out to be the toast of the town in, in Nashville. Uh, one of the things that I want to impress upon you too, that all the money, all the money that was ever earned in Coleman Furnace ended up in Nashville. All that moved to Nashville. Because when the Van Leers left and went to Nashville, that was that money. When the Kirkmans left and went to Nashville, and when the Wills, uh, Will Hours, um, they didn't have the money, but they moved also to Nashville. Their money from the furnaces actually fueled the development of uh, Nashville's history. Um, they were integral, those three families were integral in the exposition of 1897. Now, yes, I know that Tennessee became a state in uh, 1796, but they couldn't get their act together, and so the exposition was delayed a year. So, to show you how important they were, one of the members of the family I'm speaking about, when they gave souvenirs, and they give they sold them. This is a Steve Spoon with the design or the image of this Kirkman woman right here on the spoon. She was the, the uh, person that really ran the exposition, and these are actual buttons from that exposition. So they, they, they went to Nashville, and um, the war started. Okay, back in Cumberland Furnace, the lady that wrote the journal, let me tell you about her. Her father was German. He was, uh, his name was Will Auer, German, you know, obviously German. He came down from Pennsylvania because of two things. He was, he was very interested and very uh, knowledgeable about the iron furnaces, but also he was a physician. And if you've got 200 slaves working for you, you've got your family and so forth, you've got to have a physician because the furnace is not a very healthy place to work. So he would, came down and was involved with that. The journal is very clear. Um, Eleanor, the lady I'm talking about, was very specific in her journal to say that her father was not around. She did not talk about him very well. Um, her reasoning is that I believe is that while the war is going on, he left her, her mother, and her invalid brother alone when there's enemy soldiers all around them. She never got over that. She also never got over the fact that he was a Quaker. To have money was looked down upon. Only a person is looked down upon. And she, he, she always resented the fact that, that he did not provide for her mother. Now, who was her mother? Her mother was a Van Leer from the poor side of the family. But Eleanor Willauer was a direct descendant of Anthony, Van Anthony Wayne of the Revolutionary War, as was her cousin, the one I was just talking about being so beautiful, her mother died uh, at that house, that mansion in, in Nashville. So they're the poor side of the family. They're living in a house that is owned by the Van Leers. Uh, they have a slave that they don't own that is loaned to them by the, well, uh, by the uh, Van Leers. And so the journal goes, now here's the interesting part of the journal. She's a typical girl, you know, she's looking at the uh, Union soldiers as well as the Confederate soldiers, uh, sizing them up and thinking about what normal girls do, marriage and so forth. One day she walked, we're talking about Confederate armies coming through, the Union armies coming through, at any time she could be surprised by whoever shows up. She was in her, she was walking through her house and she walked into the living room, and lo and behold, she was introduced to Nathan Bedford Forrest. She said he was tall, but not too tall, had a straight nose, eyes sort of close set, handsome but balding, and then she, you know, she's sizing him up, and she's talking about him, and, and she meets Thomas Woodward, who of course was the one who uh, was from Connecticut, but became a Confederate uh, colonel, and he did not ever graduate from West Point. Let me make it, because I call it West Point. <laughs> I see in books where this is it. Call West Point, find out he did not graduate from West Point because he was drunk all the time, <laughs> which is what got him killed. So Tom, she walks in, Thomas Woodward, do you have a picture of what this guy looked like? He's about my height. He's got cavalry boots on that come up almost to, you know, right here because he's so short. He's got greasy hair, really close eyes, uh, and his, whenever he walks, his sword is hitting the, the ground because he's so short. When he comes in, and he, 
he tells Eleonora he can't stay. He can't stay. She said, well, stay. We're going to have a, a dance. You know, there's something to live it up. He stayed till 5 o'clock the next morning. And she said, while dancing with him, her hands slipped up into her hair, his hair, and just, she, like, oh. <laughs> so, so he laughed. So what she's doing in her journal, which is so interesting, is she's writing down, Forrest was in my living room today. He's headed to Columbia. Holy cow, if the Union Army came in and found her journal and read it, for Forrest is on his way to Columbia. So finally, later on in the, in, the, in the diary, you see where she's ripped out some pages and she's scribbled out some lines. She's going, whoops, don't need to write that down. So she is witness to uh, when, a, when a gorilla from the Confederate side was captured. Do you know what the punishment was? They were shot, but shot point blank in the face. So one of them got into her house and was pleading with the uh, union officers that had surrounded her house, please, you can take me out. I understand you're going to shoot me. Just don't do it in my face. And says, yes, we, we agree to that. Got him out, shot him in the face. Blood goes all over Eleanor. She sees it all. She writes about it later on. Or actually her friend, Betty Garland, does. So she sees this firsthand. So when the uh, breakout happens at Fort Donaldson and Nathan Metropolis takes whoever's going to follow him out, and we have different estimates. What are estimates? I've heard 700 as high as like 1,300. Yeah, 700 is probably a pretty accurate number, yeah. but the numbers don't agree. Yeah, they don't agree, and we'll, we'll probably never know. But he took them out, and of course his, his uh, mission was to get to Nashville as fast as possible because Fort Henry had fallen, Fort Donaldson had fallen. We know what happened in Clarksville. Nothing, nothing. So they know they're headed to Nashville. So he's taking his men out. Now, the day before, uh, the battle was very warm. They left their coats, they left their blankets, and then they woke up to, you know, horrible weather. So Nathan Bedford Forrest takes them out in the breakout, and they're headed to uh, Charlotte, Tennessee. They get to Cumberland Furnace. They're going to spend the night there. They get their horses reshod. They get uh, ammunition from the people there. And then uh, they go into Charlotte. Now, Charlotte has got something a lot of those boys have never seen before it's called taverns they get drunk these boys are country boys that have never been out of the you know off the farm they've got all these saloons and bars and stuff in charlotte and so they are indulging in that and the next morning when Forrest is ready to get on the, in the saddle and head out to nashville they're not some of them are not ready yet <laughs> so he goes around to the different bars in town and tells them get on your horses we're leaving and they weren't obeying. So he got a group of his men to circle the town and whoop and holler and all that. And he shouted out, the Union Army, the Union Army. They, they sobered up that fast. <laughs> so they get out of town and head to Nashville. When they get to Nashville, the, uh, the town is just in a state of absolute chaos, just absolute chaos. And he can't stand that. He tries to start to organize everybody. And he realizes at a point, it's not going to happen. He's not going to be able to save Nashville. So it's better to back off and find another day. So that's what he does. He takes his men out. Now, to go along with that, Eleanor Willauer, the, the poor Van Leer descendant, she, uh, she was educated at the Female Academy in Nashville. I, su I suspect that her grandfather or, or Sam, uh, Anthony Van Leer paid for her education. I don't think her father could have afforded it. But while she's there, she, her professor, C.D. Elliott, he is about as anti-union as you can get. He was almost to the point of brainwashing those girls in hatred towards the North. And because of that, he suffered. After the Union Army came through, uh, he was jailed, uh, put in prison. He was uh, he lost all of his money, his estate. He, he died a pauper. Uh, but he, he had his girls at the academy. Now, Eleanor's not there for that. But he has the girls at the academy to feed the Confederate soldiers as they're with, uh, withdrawing. And then he tells them, get on the trains and get out of here. So that's what they do. So Eleanor Willauer is angry at the Union uh, Army for so many different reasons, especially for, for putting her uh, teacher that she's so loved into, uh, into jail. So the war is going on. You're getting Confederate and Union, Confederate and Union coming through. The cousin, Florence, that's so wealthy, she inherits, her mother dies, she inherits everything now she's got a brother but the brother is not interested in the ironworks so he sells his his interest in the ironworks to florence van leer okay um excuse me kirkman she's a kirkman and so she she runs into a union officer i'm not sure where she met him 
uh, the Union Army came in and took over, obviously, the best houses in Nashville, probably because her future husband was a quartermaster that she met him while in this house. And she let the Union Army come in. She said, you can come in, but you don't destroy anything and you don't take anything. And they agreed. Now, this house, folks, is right below the state capitol, if you know where I'm talking about in Nashville. So, proximity to where the cannons are set up and where they're camped, that was a perfect ideal location for them. Okay, now we've got a Southern girl that's in love with the Union officer. She thought because of his lineage and, uh, that it, he would be accepted by our family. By the way, who he was descended from? He was Rex descendant of Napoleon Bonaparte. His great uncle was a guide for the Lewis and Clark expedition. He's got a lineage too. Well, she misunderstood thinking that everything would be okay. It would be the biggest wedding in Nashville. And guess what happens? None of her family shows up except for Eleanor Willow shows up. So she marries him and everybody's scandalized, but she's all right with it. After the war is over, um, Eleanor Willauer has also found a union officer, and I don't think she would have had the, the nerve to have married him if it hadn't been for her cousin marrying a Yankee officer first, but she married him. Both of these were love matches. A lot of people suspected uh, James Pierre Juilliard, who married Florence, that he was after her money. No, it was a love match. Same thing for Eleanor Willauer. Her husband was A. Andrew W. Wills. He became postmaster of Nashville, Tennessee. But that wasn't his first job. His first job following the war, he was commanded by the Army, of which he was still in the Army. He was in charge of setting up national cemeteries for the retrieval and burial of the Union dead. Now, you're not going to find, usually, Southern burials in the national cemeteries down south. Why? Because they weren't part of the nation. They didn't deserve to be buried in a national cemetery. They weren't Americans. They had seceded, remember? So he had to go and locate bodies and have them placed like at Shiloh and places in Georgia to have these cemeteries set up. That was his task after the war. But he wanted to marry uh, Eleanor. They got married. Now, they did not live in the luxurious uh, houses that the other two families lived in. By, by and large, I think they, they did fine. But they did not. They were not in that social set that the uh, Kirkmans and so forth were. Well, the Kirkman uh, son uh, married Kay Thompson. She was a billionaire heiress, and he married her. He lost a lot of his money uh, in Nashville with the race horses. He raced horses with Montgomery Bell, and with some other people. People don't know that Montgomery Bell was a big race horse advocate, but he was, and uh, he didn't lose money. He was smart that way, but. They built mansions. If you know where the First Presbyterian Church is, um, oh gosh, I've just lost what, what Main Street Highway it's on. It's, it's a huge estate, a uh, big mansion like you could not believe. And it's, it was torn down, and a, a, another person built a mansion there, and, and then the Presbyterian Church came in and built on the same place. Now, what happened to uh, this building? I told you this house was torn down in the 50s, I believe. The other house that she moved into when she married James uh, Pierre Juilliard, massive mansion in downtown Nashville. It's a parking lot now. Parking lot. Now, when I tell you all these things, my books are full of pictures. And if I can go inside and take the pictures myself, like at Manassas, I'm, I'm waiting through a, a swamp to get to a picture. I will go there. So this book is full of photographs, so you don't have to visualize what I'm talking about. But uh, just horrific that uh, you know that all these things were happening to these families. Now let me tell you that there was a, a saying that with the Kirkmans, whenever success looked it walked through the door, tragedy soon followed. And it went through generation after generation after generation. Even though they had all this money and this beautiful mansion, they had a son murdered, they had this one killed in a car accident later on in life, they had this going on and this on, and, it's just, and then Eleanor Willauer, who was poor, her family was just fine. It just, just shows you how, the irony of it all. So all the wealth of Cumberland Furnace is now in Nashville. So what happens to Cumberland Furnace? The furnace is actually bought out by the Warner, Joseph Warner, who's a person Warner's brother. And of course, it failed because by 1943, when it shuts down for the last time, uh, there's no work left there. 
Uh, what did Juilliard do after the war when the slaves were freed? He paid them. They, he's from the North, remember? That's what you do. You pay your laborers. So a lot of the slaves that lived in Pacoma first and worked at first stayed there. Uh, they started a community called Promised Land. I've got all that information about Promised Land and the other black communities that started up because of, of the war and, and their, their interest in the, in the Iron Furnace. Uh, the Iron Furnace was taken down and sold to a scrap dealer by the name of Saul Kazan in Nashville. It was sent off of the war effort. All that iron, all that metal work was shipped off to form our tanks and our armor, you know, vehicles and so forth for the war. So when you go to Cumberland Furnace and you look and you say, well, where's the furnace? That's where it is. But if you don't get off the main road and start going through the woods, you won't see some of the things that are the remnants. Uh, I took this up. This is the latest thing. This is called, it's called a super magnet. It's, it will pull 300 pounds. So I, I went to the original site of the furnace uh, where James Robertson was, and I threw it out in the lake and pulled in. I thought, I thought this was an artifact from the, from the furnace. <laughs> whoa, whoa, somebody told me it was what? Something from a Model T? It could have been a brake rod. I couldn't tell. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's one of those fire stokers or something. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> but anyway, I threw this out in the lake, and, and I, I traveled all over the hillsides, going through cemeteries and uh, taking the photographs. And it was in common for us doing this research that I realized something was physically wrong with me. Um, and so I, I had just had total knee replacement because I was lifting 40-pound bags of concrete making a, a, a garden path. So I blew out my knee and had to have knee replacement. But something was wrong. I was walking up the hill. I, something was just wrong. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, and then I talked, like I said, biology. I saw the second sign, and then when I saw the third sign, I drove myself to the emergency room, and the doctor came out and said, it's, it's cancer, and it's bad. So I said, i got to finish this book. I know. Where do you think going? So I got the word, and I, what I had to do, because they had to get surgery done so quickly because of how bad it was. It was stage four. I was not supposed to survive. Uh, the doctor in Clarkville told me not to even bother going through the chemo. It wasn't going to be worth it. So I went to Nashville. My doctor told me, he said, I'm going to cure you. I said, I think I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as far as we know, that's, that's what happened. But what I did, because when I went into surgery, I wasn't sure I was coming out. So uh, I, I released the book, and I hated it. I hated it. I did not get done with it, I, but I, I had promised them I was going to get the book out to them. So once I got the, once I came out of all the chemo and stuff, I was able to stop publication on the book and then finish the book and then get it out. So uh, this book means a lot to me. It means a lot to me. Uh, when the doctor was telling me how bad the chemo was going to be, he said, you got to think of something to, to fight for, to live for. And I said, okay, I got two things. I got to live for my grandchildren. I got a book to finish. <laughs> He's like, whatever. <laughs> I never heard that one. But uh, anyway, it's finished. And this is the first book where I got into some, some spicy stuff. You remember that Florence that lived in the mansion? She had a daughter also named Florence. Let me give you a quick update on her. Her daughter, even from an early age, she's getting her portrait done, and she's with her brother, and she's holding her dress up to show her little slip there. That is an indication this girl's going to be wild, okay? <laughs> she grew up privileged. Anything she wanted, she got. They said, uh, an eyewitness said, I saw Florence Fruillard driving her hat down Church Street with her garter showing. Okay, Church Street, ironically, in Nashville when it first began, was where all the prostitutes were, in the saloons. So she's not even supposed to be on that street, much less showing her heart. So she's out there doing that. That's nothing compared to what she does later on. I think she was uh, angry at her mother uh, because her mother was such a beauty and she was competing with her and so forth. So her mother introduced her to a count. His name was Count uh, de Portales. Now, folks, he was rich. He had five estates. In, he had estates in France and in Italy. He was from the old families of Italy. He had estates that would make uh, Asheville, North Carolina, what's the name of that place? Bill. Bill. Yeah, looked like nothing. She has two daughters by him, 
and because she's so wild and loose and everything, he he divorces her. Now what happens? She she tells him, well, I'm only wild because you introduced me to a world that I've never seen before. She gets herself captured and put in a harem because <laughs> she wants to see what it's like. <laughs> so she has affairs with him. this prince. She's telling him all this stuff on me. She said three men have committed suicide over the want of me. Okay, so she is absolutely gorgeous. She's doing a dance, uh, and they have pictures of her holding on to the curtain first, and then she's in this position, and then she's laying down on the floor, which had all the men just going, oh my gosh. She was just so, uh, so what does she do? She, uh, she's divorced. He gives her a great amount of money to live on, but she falls in love with a poor count, and his name is Count Alex de Montepray. So she marries him, has two sons by him, and he's just, the newspaper says he's ugly. Just, I mean, just says it. He's ugly. He's poor and he's ugly. So why she marries him, I don't know. So he divorces her. Oh, let me go back to the first marriage. This is, this is the thing that ended the marriage. You've seen the statue, the thinker? Okay, the artist was wrote in. She goes to his studio. He tells her, I need you to unclothe yourself from the waist up because I want to do a, a sculpture on you. So what does she do? She does it. She said he asked me to, so I did. So they're in a museum. This is like a year or so later. Her husband, the deportalis, is walking with her, and he sees this sculpture, and he knows immediately that's who, who that is. I don't know how he knew, but he knew. He grabs her and, and pulls her and says, what? He asked me to do it. I did it. Okay, he says, we're done. You've, been, you, you've insulted my family. We're done. So he divorces her, like I said. Now, she marries this, this second count, and she has two sons by him that eventually moved to the United States, to California specifically. Okay, 19, 1919. War's going on. She needs to get out of Europe. She wants to get back to the United States. She goes to New York. She is broke. She married the poor count. What does she do? She puts everything she ever did with everybody she did it with in Europe in the New York Times. It's a syndicated newspaper. It goes everywhere. It comes to Nashville. It goes everywhere. And she's saying all these things that you, you, you would read it today and blush. So she's making money that way. Well, when she runs out of money with that, what does she go? She goes to her mom and says, Mom, I need money. So... Uh, Mrs. Drouillard, Florence Drouillard, has to start selling off the family silver. And she's selling off, selling off, selling off, selling off. So uh, her two sons eventually come over to the United States. And this is, this is one of those wonderful things you get to do when you write a book. I used to work for the Credit Bureau Collections Department. In other words, I will find you. <laughs> so I, I was trained very, people say, how did you do that? I said, I, my training at the, uh, the Credit Bureau. So I tracked the son of the count to California. And I, I got this number and I'm calling it and I said, uh, ma'am, I'm Carolyn Farrell, I'm writing a book, blah, 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 blah. Could you tell me if Count Alex de Montempray is still alive? She said, sure, you want to talk to him? Uh, <laughs> what? I'm going to talk to a count. <laughs> so, so he answers the phone. He's 74 years old. He is just as lucid as anybody you ever met. He is just he lives in that part of California. If you remember the Great Fires, his community was the one that didn't get burned. The fires went all around him. So he's helping people rebuild. He said, I'm, I really can't spend a lot of time on the phone. We've got a lumber shipment coming in. And he said, the reason that we moved to California is because it reminded me of my uh, house in the Swiss Alps. And so, okay, so he's there doing that. And I said, okay, the reason I'm calling, I'm trying to locate where your grandmother uh, was buried. And he goes, I don't remember where I put her. <laughs> and I, I said, well, I know she's buried in California, but where? He said, I just honestly can't remember. Wasn't she, wasn't she quite a gal? I thought, that's not what I thought. <laughs> I well, thought, don't read my book, because I wrote down what, what she did. That grandmother or mother? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it was be his grandmother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, grandmother. Thank you. You're right. And so, <laughs> Anyway, I didn't call him back because I was afraid he'd ask me for a copy of the book, and I did not. I, I, surely he knew, but he said that she was, uh, he took care of her when she was old and, and so forth, so that's why he ended up being the one to bury her. <laughs> but uh, the end of the book really pulls it together. Eleanor Willauer, when her father 
the one that was always gone, uh, died. He got that much of an obituary in the paper. When her mother died, it was a big difference. Now, they contributed a lot to a lot of different things. Uh, one of the churches in downtown Nashville, on Broadway, across from the train station, that was larger they're doing. And oh, by the way, we had a Clarksville person involved in the Centennial Exposition of 1897. His name was Eugene Kastner Lewis. When they were struggling about how to get this thing started, it was Eugene that stepped in and said, this is how we organize it. Now, Eugene was present when his father's uh, Cumberland Iron Furnace okay, was destroyed by the Yankees. He was spirited out of Tennessee because his father was afraid they were going to kill him because he was so vocal watching his father's work being destroyed. So he was sent up north where he got his engineering degree and so forth. So he was very integral in the beginning of the Centennial Exposition. Why? Because he was a railroad man and they had money. And that's what that thing needed. It needed money. So they got the exposition going. It was a success. If you've ever visited Eugene Castor's uh, grave in Mount Olivet Cemetery, he's buried in a pyramid because one of the buildings at the Centennial Exposition was a pyramid. Somebody broke in, stole his body, they had to get it back, and they got a metal plate over the front of it. I don't, I don't understand that, but in the, when you walk up the walkway, there are two sphinx statues right there. So you, he was really involved in that. But that's from the parcel's perspective. Now let me tell you what I have up here. When the Kirkmans had a business in, in uh, Nashville, and I'm talking about the ancestors of this lady here, uh, Mrs. Kirkman, Eleanor Kirkman, hated Andrew Jackson. She wasn't alone, but anyway, she hated him. She chased him out of the uh, out of the store because she thought that he owed her money, and she was about to attack him. And he says, "Lady, I do not war with women." And so she would have people track uh, Andrew Jackson down the street to try to get money from him. But this is one of the Kirkman um, receipts for the business that they did. Now, of course, in and I know all of you know this because of slag. Slag is, uh, can be many different colors, at least in Tennessee. This is a raw product. Do you know my farm in Cunningham has the same vein of iron going through it? Yes. We're going to be rich someday if they ever bring back the iron industry because I thought this, this came out off my farm. So uh, this is the original ore, and depending on what color it is, black, green, blue, whatever it is, we don't get the other colors that you find up north and so forth. Uh, depends on what the mineral content is. So the mineral content will tell you exactly uh, what color it should be. Now this is one of the, they're called sad irons. Does anybody know why they're called sad irons? Because we're sad having to do with one, I guess. So it says Cumlin on it. So that tells you that's one from the Cumlin furnace. And um, as I said, uh, well, this, is, this is one of the stocks from the Warner uh, iron furnace when it was when it goes into receivership so this is what one of those stock so i'm stock in the furnace it's gone <laughs> yes ma'am I, I am so proud of that this is one of the buildings that was taken over by the union army when they were in charlotte the leach and mallory store and when the union army came through there they of course they went into the courthouse first and of course they destroyed the records they threw them out the street they invaded people's homes and um, lots of stories. It was one story of a Confederate that was uh, jailed and they would take him out daily to walk down the, down the road to the creek with a chain uh, on him and they would let him get just so close enough to the creek and then yank him back and he died of dehydration. Mm -hmm. So just to make it clear, okay I have uh, plenty of time I guess now for, for questions. Uh, there's so many things I can say but the book like I said is full full of photographs, so if you don't visualize what I've told you, you'll, you'll get it. And there's a lot in there on Florence. It's a great book. It's a great Thank book. Thank you. Thank you. I did make a mistake, and I, I repent. <laughs> I, I, I attribute this to the chemo I was under. I had chemo brain. Delver is not in Montgomery County. <laughs> it's in Stewart County. God, how did I do that? I don't know. Page 59, I think, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that's the only blank error that I found. I, I found some typos and stuff like with commas or whatever, but uh, anyway. Questions? Yes, ma'am. I actually have two. The first one's real quick. Is there a marker or anything down in Charlotte where the Cumberland furnace, where the main furnace was? Oh, yes. Oh, not on the actual site. On the highway there, where you turn off on Dry Hollow Road, uh -huh. got, there is a, a historical marker Just there. Just saying that it had been in Charlotte. 
it's in Cumberland Furnace. Oh, it's in Cumberland Furnace. Yeah. You turn off. Yeah. So when you get to Cumberland Furnace, is there an actual marker where the actual works were? What you, you can find the buildings which were, and you'll see it in the photograph, where the furnace was right here uh -huh. with the Drury Art. Now they moved it down closer to the original furnace later on, and what the lady wants to do is put, a, I don't know, a, an imprint of where the furnace was. The problem is the people in common furnace that are really into this and invested in it, they're dying off. I was uh, on the phone talking to a, a man that was going to show me the exact locations where the dams were to uh, provide water for the second furnace. And he said, Caroline, I've got cancer. I'll get back with you in May. He died. So I, I walked all over that hillside trying to visualize where it was. And I think I got it right, but I'm not sure. I found pottery and so forth that tells me there was some people there. But uh, go ahead with But you're going on to people's private property? Like yes, it's not right out where you could just drive by and look. Oh, no, no. You're actually going on somebody's property? Or? Where the furnace is owned by the village, and it's called the village, is you can go there. Oh. I'm saying it's right there on the road, you, oh. right there. Uh, and then where the other furnace is, now that's on private property, but you're right on the road. There's nothing to really get out of your car and look at. Now the, re the way that you can find the, where the second furnace was, and this is where I talked about you have to climb or go through briars and stuff, there was a flue uh, with concrete pillars that took the slag uh, off and, and dumped it as the byproduct. Those pillars are still standing. They're behind the Church of God of Prophecy, I think, there, but you got to get off the road. They're right in all those trees. Um, the Warner home is still there. It was his summer cottage. The Drury Art Mansion is still there. I didn't talk about that, but that's pretty well known, and it's all covered in the book. But, yeah, you can go there, and you can, you know, yes. I've been in all of those buildings. Uh, the the uh, blacksmith shop is a crossroad. You can see that. They used to give tours once a year before the pandemic uh, of letting you go up into the Drury Art Mansion. If you don't know, if you watch uh, Dr. Field, when he talks about we're going to send you off for rehab or whatever, where he's sending them off to is Cumberland Furnace. Uh-huh. The on-site, that mansion up there, they've got security cameras. They've got do not enter. You go up there, and the mansion used to be where they kept some of the residents. Now they've got all, oh, they put in millions of dollars worth of cabins and so forth up there. But they don't want you up there because that's where some of the celebrities are, and they don't want you up there. Uh, you can be driving down New uh a dry hollow road and you go that's that's and it's a celebrity they were out there just walking on you're going wow yeah it's on site dr phil has got a helicopter pad up there where he comes in and lands and so forth uh the commissary which is part of the, the village there that's owned by on site they put some money into it uh right now the trail train station which has been maintained by the village people are driving by throwing rocks to the windows just because they want to oh is destroying yeah the commissary which they do own is about to collapse upon itself uh, the person that was going to get really involved in that he died he died just about 10 months ago so people and the young people they're not interested in that they're, and folks that's the last intact iron village in the united states the last one so it just it, i want to shake the politicians shoulders and say do you understand what you've got here you need to invest in this this is part of the, the civil war trails you need to put and it's i know i know you know we got to take care of the present generation before we can go back and do that but it just it breaks my heart every time i go there because i see something different it's, oh they, they they spray painted the museum door with uh whatever that stuff is that gang stuff so any other questions yeah uh, well, when that man freed his two or three, four hundred slaves, however many you said it was, uh -huh. did they have his last name? A lot of them did. I've got a list of their names in the book. Oh, uh, really? Oh, yeah, a lot of them. You know, and you said there's still a lot of them in that area? I thought you said there was still a lot of them remained. Their descendants, I mean. Oh, well, there are bells. Yeah, sure, there's bells and prom promised land. And yeah, Listen, if you see a, a person with the last name Van Leer, you know what's going on. <laughs> I'm a black person. Yeah, you know what's going on. I'm sorry, it just happened. I can, I can tell you a very famous person in, in uh, Clarksville in Tennessee that had one of those running around. His name was Austin Pete. I know. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, 
did I shock you? <laughs> I probably have talked too long, but. Uh, and you have books for sale and sign. I do. I have uh, some of the other books too. If you're interested, like on Valentine's Severe, uh, Tales from the uh, Queen City of, of the Cumberland, uh, you know, whatever your interest is. But I appreciate you inviting me down here. We, I, I always love being, you know, when you're birds of a feather. It's just, it's so enjoyable. She's Thank talking you. next month in Stewart County Historical Site. Yes. We're going to be yes. talking a little bit more about Stewart County part of it. Yes. yes. <laughs> so come see us again. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much.